Happy New Year. We are back. It's the 5th of January, uh, 2021. Uh, I have to remind myself to actually say 21 rather than 2020. Uh, I'm here again with my good friend, Dov. Um, welcome to the show. Welcome to uh, the Sourcing Challenge Weekly. And it's amazing that you have survived the last episode, which was around two hours. <laughs> and if you're still keen on listening more, it's amazing to have you back. And if you haven't, and uh, you have two hours to kill, or if you do like me, put it on double speed or one and a half speed at least, and you can get it done in one hour. Uh, yeah, go back and listen to our um, episode from, yeah, from the end of last year, where we did talk about 2020 from our point of view and in the sourcing realm. Um, but yeah, it was two hours and uh, five minutes, uh, which if you want to watch it on YouTube, um, yeah, we would really appreciate that. It did take a lot of hours for my computer to actually encode that so that I could upload it. So... Uh, the podcast was out first because that is relatively easy to um, to rip the audio from, but the video took a long time. Uh, I basically had to go to sleep and go shopping next day um, to get my computer to encode it because I couldn't touch the computer at the same time. But it was fun. Uh, but definitely don't expect us to do two hour long episodes because uh, it's just too much work in terms of, you know, actually getting it up there. Uh, we might do that in the future. Um, but yeah, it's not something we're gonna we're gonna make a habit. Well, my my, you know, we might do it in a different format. So exactly, and then definitely the, we we don't necessarily need a limit. Like we can easily talk for <laughs> like hours and hours and hours. So whether we record it or not, we're gonna talk. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, if you're new to the show, um, sourcing challenge has been around for the last three years. Uh, I have done I think it's sixty four uh, episodes in terms of the interview show. Uh, which is on both our podcast and our YouTube channel. Um, we've done some talk shows last year uh, where we had uh, Dave Gallery and uh, Sophia on for, I think we had three episodes of the talk show. Uh, there's been a couple of tools episodes as well. Uh, if you want to find all of these, go to sourcingchallenge.com. Um, I'm slowly actually working on getting all of the episodes up there. So uh, by the time that it gets out, you should be able to actually find all the episodes. Uh, on uh, on that, so you can you know go directly there and watch the video, uh, listen to the audio directly on our website, or you know as always you can find us on on YouTube and all the normal podcast players and 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 get the audio version of us. But what we do on a weekly basis uh, is that we find what Dov and I think is uh, interesting things, either new videos, podcasts, articles, um, just things that we've seen around the community um, that we think is interesting and, and talk about that. I want to start with uh, a very short YouTube video uh, that you've discovered by Maisha Cannon, who was on the show previously. And she's talking about inclusive sourcing on social media. And basically, she is talking about how doing a you know, very quick research on Twitter, you can find hashtags and those hashtags would lead to different people in different communities. And as she says, all you need is one person, then you find more people, right? It's like when you go into the forest and you pick up mushrooms, there is a saying that you will never find only one mushroom, right? If one leads to another, it's the same. Um, for me, the, maybe the biggest takeaway for, for, uh, from the whole short video was that, uh, before she dived into going from one, uh, one hashtag to another, she actually uh, started the uh, timer for five minutes. And she's like, well, because I, go, I dive into deep, I don't want to go too deep. So I'm going to just take five minutes and I'm going to do a quick research uh, that I would not go lost in the rabbit hole. Uh, I'm pretty sure that sorcerers are normally going in their rabbit holes, like I, at least I do. I think it's I, an occupational I, hazard, definitely. I mean, I would start with one place and then 40 tabs later, I'm like, how did they get here? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. so, so yeah, so for me, that was, that was a really cool, uh, really cool thing. And, and, and uh, from what I understood as well, she's doing it on a, um, like more often. Yeah. So go check her uh, channel. Uh, she is Talent Genie and uh, follow her because if she's gonna be creating more content, it's free content. And seven minutes is definitely worth of your time to check it out and learn something new. No, absolutely. As I said in, in last week's show, uh, Maisha is definitely somebody you should follow. Um, yeah, I, I hadn't discovered her YouTube channel, to be honest, either. Um, I went back and I looked at that today. I, I saw that she had this new episode out. I saw that on her Twitter. Um, so I went in there and I saw that there's a lot of content going back that Maisha has put there. 
uh, I love the seven minute things. Um, Dean DeCosta does something similar where he does short reviews of new tools and puts it on his YouTube channel. Um, to be honest, there's not a lot of YouTube channels in our industry. Uh, Maisha, Dean are definitely like two of the ones to follow. Um, part of why we, we put our show on YouTube as well is that, you know, to, to, to help build up that kind of community of things that it, whether you're new to sourcing or you're just looking for inspiration that go somewhere so you can see. Uh, Maisha is definitely somebody you should follow. And there's a lot of good content going back in, in her catalog uh, on her YouTube channel. So, yeah. Uh, link is in the description so have a look at her channel and specifically that one about uh, inclusive sourcing and Maisha is one of the people that I would go to in terms of inclusive sourcing as well she's a very experienced recruiter sourcer um, manager of sourcing teams um, you, know, you can you can hear all about that on, on the interview that I did with her um, but also why we keep she keeps coming up um, as somebody that um, it's very good at writing articles, putting up new things, and, and it's good in the kind of content game. And, and always have, always based it on her own experience and on things that she has well researched. So um, definitely somebody that I would, uh, I would go to and have a look at. And, and as well, uh, to, to mention uh, what I forgot to say, that uh, what I loved about it as well, that she said that she's making a list of hashtags and list of communities. And because I think it's important to, to, to think that whenever we're doing a different or a new search, you're, you're exploring and you're getting information. But the question is, what do you do with that information? If you save that database with the hashtags, for example, and uh, uh, you will, even if it's a year later or, I don't know, two years later, you will be running a similar search. You will already have the base. You will not start from scratch. Yes, you know, in maybe in, in that time, uh, a lot of things have changed and there are new things, but it will be easier for you to go back to that kind of skeleton that you already have if you track that information. So um, I think we already talked about it, but for example, I love as well saving everything that I can, just copying into whatever, whatever way, just dumping it first onto like a note, notebook and then bringing the order into chaos and I'm using Airtable so for me it's just like I, I separate everything so universities companies hashtags uh, keywords whatever it, it's really useful no and I mean this is she specifically talks about Twitter but it, it I mean hashtags is not just about Twitter anymore either uh, LinkedIn has them and if you haven't seen that definitely Facebook definitely Facebook does that Instagram wherever it kind of is but I think it's also about thinking in that kind of sense is that whenever you do take on a search I love two things it's like actually write down what are the different things that you're looking at uh, because like yeah you might be going down a rabbit hole and 10 minutes later you forgot what you're actually looking at so writing it down so that you know uh, and that doesn't have to be a hashtag. That could be a company that's like, oh, there's a lot of people in this company that seem to have the skills that I need. Let me dig into that company specifically. I do that a lot and I end up in big rabbit holes because it's like, it's a company I've never heard of. And then you start finding out like what kind of people work there, where did they get people from, where are people going to. Um, but yeah, I definitely need to start, you know, putting a timer on as well so that I, I don't get lost in what I'm doing. And writing down, it's like, okay, I'm looking for this specific, you know, skill. This company is somebody I should look at. Um, also, if you're like, if you're deep in, in deep work and you're like, okay, this is going to be a rabbit hole. This is going to be a tangent. Writing it down so that you know you can get back to it later. Brilliant, uh, brilliant thing. But definitely, uh, yeah, starting having a timer when you know you're on sites that can easily lead you down rabbit holes. Uh, I love that. I mean, I haven't turned on Facebook for the better part of the last six months for exactly that reason. Because I know, like, you're going to get, like, I'm there for a specific reason, but then I start, you know, reading something and another thing, and then one leads to another, and, like, you end up looking at cat pictures for absolutely no reason. It's good if you're only looking for those cat pictures on Facebook, but not on YouTube videos, <laughs> because that doesn't end. <laughs> no, exactly. Yeah, yeah, and it's like, well, bad enough, my, like, my YouTube channel, like, my, my YouTube uh, is used by my daughter, so I end up getting lots of children's shows, so. Um, it, you know, which stops me in some of the things, which is quite good because like, I definitely don't want to watch that. Um, so there's not so many rabbit holes I can go down. But yeah, definitely uh, have a look at Maisha's channel, specifically that new episode that I think it came out today. Um, but also look at all the back content that she has. There's a lot of, I've met Maisha and seen her talk a uh, number of times. 
um, I know that she has a broad range of um, experiences from recruiting for retail, working for, uh, working for Google as a sourcer. Um, so there's definitely lots of stories and lots of you know, personal experience that you can build on. Um, so yeah, definitely salute Maisha for, for this channel. And then, yeah, as Dov said, I hope there's a lot more coming um, because there was kind of seven minutes. It's, it's, a, it's easy to kind of, you know, to get in. Um, but at the same time, it's like, you know, we hope that much more is going to come from Asia. Oh, yeah. Okay. What, what, what was the, what was for you, like one of the highlights of the week? I don't know. I mean, it's, it's the beginning of January. You always get a lot of like, you know, best of 2020 uh, predictions for the year. Um, I haven't been as much like I, yeah, uh, we started work yesterday and I, I actually enjoyed having some time off and, um, other than doing what the two of us are doing and like doing the show and kind of getting that up from uh, uh, like I spent most of New Year's day, a uh, New Year's Eve day actually getting that up. Um, but other than that, it's like, yeah, I, there hasn't been a lot kind of things that that has stood out to me because a lot of people are kind of slowly getting back to work now. Um, but I do see a lot of those kind of predictions for, you know, goal settings and predictions for, for you know, for, for 2021. Uh, which is also always like, yeah, you, you kind of have, especially I listen to a lot of podcasts and that's what you end up having is like, it's an end of the year show uh, where you're looking at everything that happened. And then it's the beginning of the year show where you do predictions. And then at the end of the year, well, you start with, you look at the predictions you did last year and you found out that none of them were applicable, especially for last year, because it's like, guess what? 2020 was an absolute, you know, dumpster fire. Um, so no matter what goals you had pretty like it's, pretty much like you're you're sure that you probably didn't reach any of them unless you've like been really lucky and you, know, you had vague goals and then it's about setting goals for a year that you have no clue what's going to happen or if you know if we're still going to be on lockdown most of the year um so, so basically we already did our best of 2020 yeah so. we did our best of 2020 <laughs> I, I don't really, I, I'm not going to set a lot of goals. Like I'm, I'm looking forward to this year. Uh, one, um, I'm hoping that conferences is going to come back. Uh, what I've seen, a lot of conference organizers are definitely looking at it's like, yes, when we can, we want to bring back in-person conferences. But at the same time, we know we need to have a hybrid model so that we, like not everybody's going to want to come or are going to be able to come. So all the conference organizers that I kind of looked at are looking at, can we have hybrid models where we have the in-person, but we have an online or digital version as well. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be interested to see that. Um, and, but at the same time, it's like, I liked having a lot of this kind of content coming out uh, as we talked about before as well. We just hope that, you know, there's going to be some in innovation in terms of how the content comes out. So it's not always like, you know, three days with 50 speakers, because it's like, you can just like, you saturate the market and, you know, you get brain freeze from listening to that many people. Um, no, that's, that's, that's true. And, and actually, if, if anyone watching has any ideas what, how you would like, the, you know, even sourcing events to, to go, reach out to us. Because yeah. who knows, we might, we might introduce something later in the year. Because, Absolutely. Because I think that uh, as, as much as we want real conferences to return, we need to be really realistic. Uh, you know, UK just went into the lockdown yesterday in complete shutdown. Of course, that's what media says, and re reality is very different. But nonetheless, like we, we even if we want to leave or if you want to go anywhere, it's impossible. And and I believe that still uh, a lot of our movement will be determined depending on whether we have access to vaccine. If we want to have a vaccine or not, that's a very different conversation. We don't want to get into that. No. <laughs> it's going to be extremely complicated. That's what I'm trying to say. And if, if I was an events organizer, I would really be realistic and, and I would go completely virtual. I would skip 2021 for the sake of, you don't know, you, it's impossible to plan anything. No, exactly. Uh, and you, you see that. I mean, like, even, not just in our industry. I've seen it in other industries as well, where they're like, there's in the podcast industry as well, there's a couple of events that is supposed to happen. And one of them like is in the UK and they had two alternative dates. They've already moved it from, it's not going to be in May to later in the year. But even that one is like, like that's a 10,000 people conference where it's like, is that really going to happen in Manchester at 
like you know in September or whatever that is and and like the people that I was listening to they're like you know they're industry people that would normally like they're vendors that would like do we want to sponsor do we even want to go it's like regardless of where we are it's like 10,000 people at a conference center and you know that is that really I mean, we're nowhere near those kinds of levels. Like, I think the biggest conference that I've been to in recruitment is like 900 people. And that was extreme. Um, and it's definitely like, it was a lot of fun. You didn't actually see 900 people unless you were in the kind of keynotes. But it's like, it's not, I think we talked about this before as well. It's like, it's not necessary. Um, and I, I would much rather have events that are smaller uh, where we can have social distancing. Um, and then it's like that the conference organizers think about like, how can we get, a mix between the people who can be here in person um, and, you know, digital. Um, but yeah, you know, that's kind of, and I think in the same kind of vein, it's like, it's January. This is a perfect time for you to think about what am I missing in terms of training? It's like, you're probably not going to have a lot of conferences to go to, which is what a lot of companies and a lot of people spent their, you know, the personal training budget on, or kind of like, you know, we used to have that dub and I as well, like, where do we want to go? What conferences? Like, you know, what do I save money for? How can I get a ticket to there? Can I help out? Things like that. Am I speaking? Which ones do I want to choose? And that, like, that wasn't necessarily about the money, but it was just about budgeting our time. It's like, you know, I don't want to travel as much this year. So which one can I go to? Can I do more local events rather than the international ones? But it's the same with training. Um, I, I've done a lot of training. I've done a lot of training in person uh, last year, well, year before. Uh, I worked with social talent for some of their in-person training uh, and, you know, that was brilliant, but it's not going to be a lot of that happening either. Um, so like, think about like, there's a lot of things coming on. It's a lot of like online training um, at very qualities, but definitely look at what is it you want to do and, and think about rather than, you know, spending your whole kind of training budget on going to one or two conferences, have a look at what training is out there. Um, there's a lot of us that are working on things uh, like I'm working with Kim and Gordon Lokenberg. So I'm putting something out in February and March. Um, uh, so definitely look at that. And, and I think that that for me is what I always do in the beginning of the year. It's like, what am I missing? Um, I'm always yeah. looking at like, you know, I normally have a goal for things that I want to learn during the year. It's like, this is a big topic. Um, I had it last year as well. I think both of us, both you and I did in terms of the kind of social media aspect and, you know, Facebook advertising, Instagram advertising and things like that. And that was some of the things that I looked at during the lockdown um, because I had a lot more time than normally. Um, and that I learned a lot from that, that I can then bring into sourcing and into what we do daily. But yeah. that's definitely what I think people should be looking at. And and on the other hand, I think that there's, if we, if, if you really look, there's a lot of free content out there. Absolutely. There are a lot of, there are a lot of blogs. There are a lot of videos like, you know, Maisha is a very good example. Yes, it's a very short video, but there are more people who are creating videos. Uh, you know, we just mentioned her right now because that's a fresh video. Yeah. And I believe that her channel deserves a follow uh, because the more people follow her, the more content she will be putting out because that's, the, that's where the motivation comes in, right? Uh, regarding conferences, another thing that I would uh, suggest for the organizers to consider that the work has changed and the companies has changed in a sense that they might not have those budgets for financing trips or educational stuff anyway. On the other hand, the, uh, the virtual events, they automatically have to be cheaper than, than the real events. But on the other hand, let's say if going to Amsterdam for a conference uh, would be, I don't know, minimum thousand euros, including the, the hotel and the, the flights and, and the tickets and the, even more, right? Like it, I think it could be easily 1,200 euros for like three days. Um, and you don't work during those days. Yeah. So that's either it's done through the holidays or it's your employer pays for that. So now when you really consider that's a big amount that the company would be paying for you and now, when that is reduced to, let's say, 150 or $200, they can easily say, well, okay, so choose one event and we're going to give you like $300. So even with that, you are limited to what you can do. Mm. And if you're going to jump on board onto the very first event that's going to be announced, you might miss out on something that's going to happen in the second part of the year and you will not have that opportunity. 
So uh, before deciding on any of the events, my suggestion would be just first of all to look, just Google in your area. Uh, well, now when it's virtual, it's, it's easier, but for example- You don't even know. I think a, a lot of them are not even announcing if they're like, I think a lot of the organizers are waiting to kind of see what happens. Like we're hearing about events that are, might happen in, in, you know, in the upcoming months, but it's like nothing is a public yet. So even that, and it's yeah. like, like personally, I'll much rather focus on training um, because it's something that I can, I can use all year. I can go back. Uh, especially with digital training, I can go back and rewatch it and use it in my daily life. Um, the conferences, it's like a lot of it is like, you know, you get three days full on and then you, you kind of spend a week decompressing and finding out like, what are these things can I actually bring to myself where uh, a lot of the kind of training is it's like it's, it's self-directed or at least it's not full on. Like, you know, what, what I'm working with the Lokenbergs on is like, it's a month long, but it's for like an hour and a half every day rather than, you know, you know full on for a week. Um, which is, which is, if you really think about it, which is a lot. It is a lot. It is uh, a lot. But I, I'd rather do that than do like a full day training eight hours because I know like after an hour you stop absorbing uh, the information. Um, I'd oh much yeah, rather, especially yeah. for example when it comes to lock and burst, they're extremely technical. <laughs> so you, you really, if you, and 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 they're really good at what they do. But at the same time, for example, Gordon is very fast. So you really need to, you know, get your shit together and follow and you really be there. So I don't think it would be possible to do it for eight hours nonstop because no. you just have an overload of information. And you I mean, it's not even like even what? the way that Gordon trains is much more about giving people a little information and then letting them work with that homework on it. And then uh, like Gordon's way of training is much more of like, I'll sit with you for an hour and then I'll see you in a week. Um, rather than trying to get everything done in a week kind of thing. So it's like yeah. so that you have, and that's much more what I want to work on. And that's why I'm working with them on that kind of concept where it's like, we'll do something every day. It's going to be something different. So it's more about like, how do we get training in month? Like, and February is perfect for that because it's like that kind of four week thing, especially February this year, which starts on a Monday. Um, so you're going to get four weeks of training um, and kind of have something every day, but it doesn't have to be like, you know, full on one and a half hour, and training but even with the training it's like yes you're going to have that kind of theoretical part but then there's going to be like what does that mean in practice let me show you how to do it and then give people the opportunity because you're there live use that it's like ask the questions you have like do you have an example can we try that with this so that next day like next morning you can like okay i i have something new i want to try out and you can try that because yeah. that for me is much more powerful than you know, having been away for three days and you're just like, well, there's this talk and that talk and I don't really remember everything. And, and another thing, for example, um, this is how my brain works, but as well, everyone is very different. But maybe for those who are at the beginning of their journey, if you are overwhelmed with the information that you're, you know, finding or bombarded, bombarded with, the best way uh, is to actually start making notes of what you find useful in the sense that, uh, let's say, uh, even uh, Maisha's video, right? So she gave you some uh, specific points, uh, like tips, what to do. And basically her video is on Twitter. So what I would do, uh, I would go into start.me and I would, this is my dumpster. <laughs> this is where, where I vomit my sourcing and, and brain and everything, what I can. And then you start bringing in the, 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 the you know, the, uh, some logic behind it, right? And with Start.me, what I love is that you can uh, embed different content. So you embed notes, you can embed websites, you can, you can save stuff. And I even, I remember I was doing the same when I was reading Jan's book or I was doing Aaron's training, you know, how to scrape uh, Slack. Instead of for me going back and forth, like on the video when I actually need to do it, because this is not necessarily something that I was doing often, <laughs> I, I, I wrote down the, like the to-do list, you know, step by step. And I named, the, I named that, you know, that card, like scraping slack, you know, and then you start building your own database of basically scripts that you can use when you have to, rather than then start doing the, you know, going in because it's going to be easier for you in the long run. You know, you might not be uh, looking into Slack right now, but who knows, maybe At some point you will. So. 
No, and if you're in one of the big uh, enterprise companies and, and you, you know, there's a lot of tools that you're not allowed to, uh, have a look at OneNote. Uh, Microsoft came out with a, a brilliant tool which has a lot of those features as well. You can put cards, you could put multimedia, that you can put everything in one thing um, and it kind of lives in OneNote. So um, I've been with a couple of companies where it's like, you know, everything is Microsoft ecosystem, but there is a lot of good tools for that. Um, and OneNote is definitely one of the ones that I know a lot of recruiters and sources are using. I'm using it as well, um, but I'm I mean, using it for a different purpose. I'm using yeah. OneNote for storing the approach messages and, 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 and that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I mean, uh, going back as well, you were saying Jan's book is a brilliant, this is a brilliant time for that as well. If you are thinking about sourcing, um, training, recruitment training, um, start with the books. If you haven't read uh, Jan's and Katrina's books, um, then, you know, definitely good place to start. Uh, Robot Proof Recruiter and Full Stack Recruiter, uh, of course, the ultimate edition. Um, but with both of them as well, it's like there's just a lot of things in there that you can like just actually starting to read the books. Um, there's a lot of rabbit holes in terms of that, but also there's just going to be something that like triggers something and you're like, I want to learn more about this. Um, both of them have done a re really real research book, yeah. but it's not the end all and be all. So it's like, you'll have things. It's like, this is really interesting. How do I find more information about that? And then you find your own little rabbit hole. It's like, that's, I mean, that's how Dove and I learn. That's what most of us, like the people that we are close to learn is like, we find something that we think is interesting. And then, you know, we might spend the next two years kind of digging down that rabbit hole and becoming experts in that little aspect of our, our, our niche. And at the same time, it's when you are reading something on the subject that you are interested in, you will easily going to do it on a Saturday, on a Sunday, because if you really want to do it, and it's just, you know, at the end of the day, sourcing is just curiosity, right? I'll never forget when I was working with Andy and that was, I had no idea what I'm doing. There was a moment when I was losing myself and I was like, <laughs> I was headhunting, head like I was sourcing sorcerers. Uh, and that's already an inception and matrix in one. And, and I was reading this book. Um, I just don't remember by whom, but I, I got it for free, which was 150 quid or something. It was one of the first books on sourcing and it was like a massive one. I've, I found it on my iPad and I was like reading, reading, reading. On 1 a.m. on Sunday, I was still reading that book <laughs> and uh, it, it got me hooked completely like a, like, like a, a thriller or something. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and then making highlights, you know, just like what, 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 how I would read Jan's book is exactly the same. And then what happened that I was reading something that was completely irrelevant, but my brain was like going on, on fire, right? It was scanning something and trying to connect the dots. And then an hour later, I was like, oh shit. And an idea came to me, you know, and I remember I was struggling to find emails of people on LinkedIn or something. And then because of something that I've read, I decided, oh, I need to look into the, into the source code and to see maybe there's an email there. And for 80% of, of the time, the email would, would be there. I couldn't wait to go back into the office the next day on Monday morning <laughs> to test this theory. And then I was sending out emails to those people that I couldn't find emails. And I was like, what? And you, and you know, you would not be doing that on Sunday night. You know? oh, exactly. Well, normal people anyway. Well, but, but it just shows that that inspiration for a new idea can come from anywhere, but it has to be triggered by the content that was relevant. Because if I wasn't reading that specific book, I would not put my brain into, I wouldn't call it a work mode. Mm -hmm. It was just curiosity. I, I look at sourcing as a as, as solving puzzle, right? Because it is a puzzle. It's the plain detective. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, speaking of puzzles, uh, another thing that you can definitely do in January, if uh, if you, you're thinking about doing training or just getting your your brain back to work, uh, go to Jan Texas uh, Sourcing Games. Uh, there is God knows what twenty something he's up to now. Um, I, I still I, I still have problems with some of them just getting past question one in some of them. So um, they're perfect kind of brain teasers. Like they're all relevant to what we do. Like the questions are not necessarily something you would work with daily, which is exactly why they're there. Uh, it's for you to kind of challenge yourself and maybe work with your team to challenge each other um, to finish in the different sourcing games. But what you 
definitely going to learn is that you'll you'll learn to do something new so that you can actually answer like you you'll you'll be searching for like how do i actually solve this uh, and it's just going to be like it's going to be frustrating uh, you might want to do it at the end of the day because uh, you can easily spend like if you try to do that in the morning you can easily spend the whole day um, I remember uh, interviewing some of the, the, the sourcing teams in Estonia that was at the final of the team challenge um, for SourceCon in, in Amsterdam. Uh, and I know a lot of them are kind of like they would have an hour on Friday where they would go in and they would kind of compete against each other on the sourcing games like the Nortel team was doing a lot of that because they were like, well, we keep learning things. But if we learn together, like we, the more, more of us, like one of us is going to have an idea to have to solve it. Uh, and I thought that was a brilliant brilliant kind of way especially if you're lucky enough to work in a team uh, it's a brilliant way to get closer as a team but also you figure yeah. out different people in your team are different are good at different things uh, we saw that in the team challenge that you know the, the, the team that eventually won is like we're working as a team they all had different specialities where depending on what the question was like somebody in that team would be faster at answering it um, because it's like we're all wired differently in our brain. Um, so we all solve problems differently. And, and when we come up with questions for these challenges, a lot of the times it's different people that are doing the challenges. So we think differently as well when we create challenges. And sourcing game for that is brilliant. And at the same time, it has a lot of... Uh, so, for example, in, in recent year or so, Jan started... Uh, creating the solution for hackathons as well. And I remember for Sosu, we were using that as well. And then uh, those hackathon questions, they end up in one of the sourcing games. So of course, you know, the, the, the further you go, the, the harder it becomes, but you get to see how the hackathons are created as well. Because, uh, you know, I've, I was attending several hackathons last year at the conferences. And sometimes you just really feel miserable. You really <laughs> feel like, oh my God, I what's happening because it can be really challenging but then you realize that you're the only one who puts yourself into a corner because actually there's always a way out it's just about trying to look from a different perspective and find it uh, my I, I can tell you like my challenges but i I'm, I'm i'm trying to solve it too fast and I might not necessarily read the whole thing straight away. <laughs> Which is a thing, you're overthinking. It's like, yeah, oh, no, yeah, no, the solution for this. It's uh, this really convoluted way. And a lot of things, it's like the answer is in the question. Yeah. Uh, you know, most of the hackathons, whether it's, it's Jan's hackathon, the, the sourcing games, or it's like the online or the ones in conferences, a lot of the time it's like the wording of the question is half of the answer. It's like if you actually follow the direction of the question, finding the answer it's going to be much quicker uh but yeah. most people mo most of us don't read things like we you know we trained our eye to, to speed read which means like we only read every like three, six words yeah, yeah so words, it's like yeah. so we think we know what the question was because oh, I, I know like it's a bit like you know finishing somebody else's sentence but that's not what they wanted to say um so yeah we try to find a solution to a question that wasn't actually asked yeah. Um, which, yeah, I, I do the same all the time. And it's like, you know, you have to really train yourself on look what it actually says rather than what you think it says. Exactly. But it's definitely a very good place to, to, to go. Yeah. Speaking of Jan, um, I saw he shared uh, again on Twitter, uh, he shared a, a list of uh, Google dorks and um, yeah, updates for that. Uh, if you don't know what Google dorks is, uh, definitely talk to Gordon Loganberg. Uh, Google Dorks is, it's, it's one of the kind of things that's used in OSINT, but a lot of it use it every day. Uh, when we say x-raying a site, it's part, part of Google Dorks. So a lot of those kind of operators that you can use in Google when you're searching for things, like when we use the site command to, <clears throat> to x-ray into a specific website to find user profiles. Um, this is a, a really good list. Um, I, I read through it again and I was like, yeah, there's a lot of commands that I don't think about. Like I would use in title or in URL a lot, but I never thought about using all in title. Um, so if, if I have a list of words where I know it's like, I want all of these to show up in the ones that I'm searching for. So rather than trying to make some convoluted, you know, Boolean search with putting and like putting ors and ands and things like that. It's like, if I don't want it all to be ands, it's like, well, then put it in, like make sure it's all in um, so that I'd only find results where all of my keywords are in. Um, so definitely you know, have a look at that. And yeah, just generally like follow Jan on Twitter. Uh, he's always really good at 
the content that comes from Jan uh, is either things that he writes and things, but it's, it's well curated content from the sourcing, recruitment, and OSINT's um, world. Um, and then just generally, Jan likes coming out with jokes as well, uh, which Friday is jokes fun. that sometimes end up on Thursday. Exactly. You know, it's what it is, but it's like there's always things coming out from Jan. It's well curated. Um, he doesn't just like, you know, automatically forward lots of things. Uh, it's things that he would have read uh, that he feels is relevant to him and to us and to the community. So definitely follow Jan. Um, but also um, Sanket, who wrote this article, uh, is, there's a lot of different articles on that site uh, about a lot of developer things, but like definitely lots of curated lists as well. So have a look at that. Cool. I think, I mean, that's what I had for this week. Uh, what are you up to for the next week, Dov? Oh, I mean, where do I begin? Uh, it's, you know, with the whole lockdown, it's a bit interesting. But at the moment, I'm actually, I'm looking for a job. <laughs> that's my update. Uh, that's a big update. And uh, because the freelance market has shifted drastically and I've seen quite a few of the people that we know uh, going for, you know, more like a permanent jobs and, and, you know, you are one of them as well. I, I'm one of them. And yeah, we saw it was it yesterday where uh, Shamila van der Tunen was, was one of them as well. Uh, yeah. To be fair, Shamila works with Willem, who is a very one of the old school sourcers in the, the European sourcing community as well. Like I probably would have done the same. The company she works for looks really cool. I know like part of her team. Um, and in the, yeah, that the freelance sourcing slash recruitment industry has been a bit difficult uh, in the last yeah year soon. Um, a lot of the contracts that, that we can get are shorter. Um, I ended up taking a permanent job exactly for that reason as well. Uh, you know, being a freelancer is all nice and fine, but at the end of the day, you have to pay the bills. And if, if all you get is one month's contracts here and there, uh, it's not, you know, sustainable. Um, so, yeah, but definitely anybody out there is looking for a uh, good sourcer, good recruiter. Um, I can highly personally recommend Dov. Um, and you. I mean, you, you, you can just listen to how he thinks, like just listen to this show, go back and listen to the, the episode that we did on the Sourcing Challenge show with Dov um, or any other talks that he's done at conferences. Uh, Dov is pretty much an open book. Uh, but also is somebody that it is very, <laughs> that's, that's very, easy <laughs> very, very quick to learn. But also you do have a lot of experience from from uh, from different companies and different industries that you can bring to any company company, um, either, you know, miraculously looking for a freelance or uh, if they have the right kind of job for a permanent role as well. No, thank you. And actually, if any one of you is looking for a job, do get in, do get in touch with us. Maybe we can we can help somehow as well, because the the, the industry is changing and. You know, we do have big network of people in the industry and we do see if someone is posting and we can always link, uh, you know, if, if there's a way for us to help as well. Exactly. So maybe so we can even have a list of, maybe this is something that we can take offline and just think what we can do about it. But definitely. Um, yeah. But yeah. And whether you're in Europe or Asia or, uh, you know, North America, South America, uh, yeah, you know, let us know. Uh, we definitely have um, a good community of people everywhere in the world. So uh, if you don't know where to go, then we can definitely have a look at that and, uh, and see maybe we know somebody that knows somebody. I mean, that's how this industry works. Yeah, because at the same time right now, uh, I think a lot of jobs will be remote anyway. So there are more opportunities, especially for sourcers, because like, think about it, uh, what, a year and a half ago, there were only several companies that were fully remote. And now I, mean, I had to fight with that. Both my wife and I had to fight for that for the last, like I've been working from home for, well, my daughter is six. So yeah, six years now. Um, and my wife is the same thing. And it's, we've had a lot of fights with companies about like, oh no, we need to be in the office. It's like, look, I don't want to. Um, you know, for exact, like I had it early when my daughter was born. It's like, I, I spent six months having to go into London every day. It's like, I see her for an hour in the evening and I'm out of the house before she gets up. That's not what I want to be, um, yeah. which a lot of people is like they've gotten too much of it because now they're, you know, the kids were home during the lockdown because they didn't go to school. And they're like, oh, please, let me go back to the office. Um, but at the same time, like there's a lot of us that enjoy being at home and working from home um, and where we don't necessarily want to be in one specific country. So I, I really hope that there is a lot more openness about that now. 
um, so that we don't, you know, that we don't have to pretend being in another country just so that we can kind of get work. And uh, I think what was a challenge for me in, in some of the companies that I worked uh, recently when I was in the office, that for a source of that's not the environment that is friendly, because when you are sitting together with recruiters, with the coordinators, and everyone is always on the phone and there's chatter, and, and you, you're trying to do the search and going down that rabbit hole, all of those distractions, they really not help. And there is a limit, even when you like listening to music, of how loud you can listen to it. <laughs> because no. then, you know, you're damaging your ears and that's not what you should be doing. And uh, I think that right now, the big challenge is that, and I've been saying this since the beginning of last year, that, um, you know, there were so many companies who would say, oh, yo, you can't work from home. Imagine right now the company, you know, once we get out of this, because it will end at some point, we just need to be patient, saying, you know, you come to them and say, yeah, I, 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 I want to work from home. It's like, no, I'm sorry, we don't have a working from home policy. You're like, what? I'm sorry, what? <laughs> you don't have, what? I was working from home for like a year and a half. <laughs> Yeah. And you need a policy for that now. <laughs> no, exactly. I mean, there's going to be some people that are going to want to come back to the office, and I completely understand that. Um, and then there's going to be a lot more people like I actually enjoy working from home. Um, so, yeah, like I hope that a lot of more come. And you've seen that a lot of the kind of big companies, especially in the U.S., have said, like, we will work like we are now a remote first company. We will be working from home indefinitely. Um, I spoke to a company in the U.S. yesterday as well, a uh, recruitment company that says, like, well, look, our lease was coming up. And since everybody was at home anyway, we just didn't renew the lease. So Perfect. now we're all working from home and don't see that changing. And I was like, I thought that was brilliant because it's like a lot of it was about like, well, it's the norm that you need to have an office. But, you know, uh, the owner of that company just saw it as like, I, I, that, there's no need for it. And even when we do go back from, you know, from the different lockdowns we have, we don't really need to have an office. This works. So why, you know, it's going to give me some extra money to spend on other things for the team rather than have to pay rent just for. And imagine how much money they're saving as well. And people who are not commuting anymore. Yes, I mean, it's time. That's the thing. It's like I used to spend three hours per day to go to and from London. And that was if the trains were on time. Yeah. Um, you know, it's and like, they're not you don't get paid for that. And I, I was like, well, look, that's a lot of time per week, like 15 hours per week just in, and it's not even that you can whip out the laptop and start working. It's like if no. anybody's ever lived in like any of the zones outside of London, it's like, you know, I was outside of zone six uh, and, and having to have an hour in a train, it's like, yeah, if, if you go in the middle of the day when everybody's at work, I'm sure you can find a table and you can start working. But if you're in the morning and the afternoon rush hour, you're lucky if you can actually find a place to stand. Um, or if so, you need like, to change four times, for example. Then exactly, which a lot, of, a lot of people don't. I mean, that's one of the reasons that I, I never lived inside, like in the middle of London, because like even my colleagues who lived in the middle of London would spend longer because they would have to change the tube four times. Uh, whereas like I can jump on one train and be there. Um, but yeah, things like that, it's like you don't. And, and a lot of people everywhere in the world as well is driving to work. It's like, other than listening to a podcast like this one, you don't really get to do a lot of things that is productive. Like, it's not like you're going to be on the phone or sourcing and things like that. So yeah, a lot of that is like, we are now able to just roll out of bed and start working, uh, which definitely is going to make us a lot more productive. And we know as well, it's like once it, you know, whatever that your day finishes, you don't going to stop. You might go grab some food and spend some time with your, with your kids or you're, you're, you're with your family. But at the same time, it's like, you're probably gonna, you know, oh, I'm just gonna finish something in the evening because it's right there. It's like, I mean, that's one of the you know, bad things for some, um, but you, must, you get much more productivity out of it and you don't waste the time on, on commuting. No. Cool. Definitely. Look, we'll be back again next week. Um, as Dove said um, last time, this time, if you have anything that you would like us to share, or you have any ideas on what you want the show to be about, let us know. Um, you can find Dove on sourcewithdove at gmail.com. You can find me and on LinkedIn and uh, in the top 39. Uh, find him on uh, Instagram. And Actually, so for Instagram, I, I do have an account source with Dove, I think. It's, it's, it has zero content right now, but actually I'm considering start posting there about sourcing and about co career coaching. So if that's your thing, you can follow. 
go follow it up there. Uh, you'll find me, I, my email is uh, mark at sourcingchallenge.com. As I said as well, if you missed any of the uh, past episodes, this is episode three. If you missed the past episodes of this show, uh, the 64 um, Sourcing Challenge show episodes, um, you can go to sourcingchallenge.com. And um, most of the episodes will be on there um, by the time that this goes live. So definitely, um, if you want to share this show or any other show um, that we've done with, with your friends or your colleagues, um, you know, guide them to there where they can watch or listen to all the old episodes and the new ones as they come out. Um, but yeah, that's definitely, that's to be shared. Um, look, you know, if you like the video, if you like the, the podcast, that's good. But if you want to help us, then share it with somebody who you think would be, sh should be interested in hearing what we say or is interested in the other kind of back catalog we have. Um, share it with your colleagues, share it with your manager um, and just, you know, keep spreading the word for us. And when you share it, just one thing, don't just send the link or don't just post the link, write at least a sentence why you're sharing and what you're sharing, because you are sharing it with your community, because someone who is following you, they're, they're your community. That's how you need to look at it. And they make their life easier and tell what you're actually sharing and why you want them to see it. Otherwise, they will just scroll and just scroll and scroll. So... This is something that I've noticed as a blogger. So <laughs> what musicians, good musicians do and what they don't. So it makes, it gets more engagement when you actually give your two cents of what you're sharing. Yeah, definitely. Look, it's been real. Um, thank you very much for today. And I'll see you again next week. See you next week.